chapter twenty one of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one bolted however slowly the rumour of rollitt's dishonesty had spread through the school the news of his disappearance spread like wildfire mr forder's desire to keep the matter from being talked about was eminently futile for wally and percy wheatfield both knew all about it five minutes after fisher major had discovered the absence of the suspect by everybody except a very few infatuated persons such as york and fisher minor rollitt's flight was taken as conclusive evidence of his guilt if he hadn't done it why shouldn't he stay and face it asked clapperton the wonder to me is sneered dangle that he brazened it out as long as he did suppose you were in his shoes said york suspected by every one with the evidence black against you and dangle in charge of the prosecution how would you like it if i'm in charge of the prosecution said dangle colouring up it's because you whose duty it was to see the matter put right were doing all you could to shield the scoundrel i did nothing because i didn't believe him guilty and i don't yet said the captain hotly and if you call him scoundrel again in my hearing i'll knock you down keep your temper said dangle glad all the same that there were one or two fellows between him and the captain you may not care about the credit of fellsgarth we do you retorted york with such withering contempt that dangle half wished he had left the matter alone the thing is said ranger what is to be done nothing said york forder has gone to tell the doctor all about it they'll take it into their own hands to hunt him down perhaps with dangle's assistance all we've got to do is here fullerton interrupted is to say all the evil we can about a fellow who is down and can't defend himself what's the matter with fullerton said clapperton with a sneer surely he's not become one of rollitt's champions if it matters specially to you what i think said fullerton i don't believe a word of your precious story first of all fisher major's such a fool at accounts that it's not at all certain the money is lost secondly dangle is the accuser thirdly rollitt is the accused fourthly because if a similar charge were made against me i should certainly disappear ha ha snarled brinkman they've got hold of poor fullerton have they i wish them joy of him thanks very much said fullerton i don't intend to desert the dear moderns you will have a splendid chance of taking it out of me for daring to believe somebody innocent that you think guilty i shall be happy to see any three of you whenever you like i can hit out as well as young quarter so i hope brinkman won't come but dangle now or even clapperton i shall be charmed to see it's really their duty as prefects to suppress any one who dares have an opinion of his own i simply long to be suppressed this astounding revolt for the time being diverted attention from the topic of the hour the laughter with which it was greeted by the classics present did not tend to add to the comfort of clapperton brinkman and dangle who very shortly discovered that it was time to go to their own house wait for me said fullerton i'm coming too and to their disgust the rebel strolled along with his hands in his pockets in their company whistling pleasantly to himself and absolutely ignoring their unfriendly attitude meanwhile the question where is rollitt continued to exercise fellsgarth from the headmaster down to the junior fag bit by bit all that could be found out about his movements came to light his study was visited by the masters it disclosed the usual state of grime and confusion his fishing-rod and tackle were there there had been no attempt to pack his few belongings which lay scattered about in dismal disorder the photograph of the pleasant homely-looking woman on the mantelpiece with the inscription below alfred from mother stood in its usual place his aristophanes lay open in the window-sill at the place for to-day's lesson everything betokened an abrupt and hasty departure among the papers on his table was a fragment of some accounts recording the outlay of little more than a few pence a week since the beginning of the term 
when inquiry came to be made it was found that he was last seen after afternoon class yesterday when he unexpectedly went to the school shop and purchased from the attendant there who had been put in charge of that establishment during the indisposition of the managing directors half a dozen abernethy biscuits the matron at wakefield's remembered that only a day or two ago a parcel had arrived for rollitt another unusual circumstance containing a ham of this possession no sign was now to be found in his study the inference from all these circumstances of course was that however abruptly he had departed he had not gone home but somewhere where food would not be easy to procure in the ordinary way messengers were sent to penchurch to acquaint the police and inquire at various places on the way for news of the missing boy but no one had seen him out of touch for several days since his last fishing expedition his home address was of course on the school books and thither a telegram was sent but as the place was beyond the region of the wire no reply came for a day when in answer to the doctor's inquiry if the wanderer had returned home there came an abrupt no meanwhile the doctor had had another conference with the seniors of both houses and inquired with every sign of dissatisfaction into the merits of the suspicions which were the apparent cause of rollitt's disappearance to his demand why the matter was not reported to him yorke replied that as far as he and fisher major were concerned they did not suspect rollitt and therefore had had nothing to report the modern seniors on the other hand put in the plea that they had looked to the classics to take the matter up and when they declined to do so had reported the matter to mr forder then the doctor went into the particulars of dangle's feud with the missing boy much to the embarrassment of the former he insulted you by turning you out of mr wakefield's house you say why were you there i went to speak to some juniors about what clapperton wanted them no i didn't you went interrupted clapperton silence clapperton what were they wanted for dangle they had cheated at elections what was your object then to punish them are you not aware that the captain of a school is the only prefect who is allowed to punish yes sir but well we were not sure that their own prefects were going to take any notice of it i caned all four of them for it and you saw me do it said yorke humph and as to rollitt how came he to be present asked the doctor he came in what were you doing when he came in there was a scuffle you were striking those boys what did rollitt do did he strike you no sir what then he he said dangle flushing up to be obliged to record the fact in the presence of the other seniors he dragged me across the green then you say he attacked you on another occasion on the football field and dangle had to stand an uncomfortable cross-examination on this incident too what had it all got to do with rollitt asked every one of himself i ask you all these questions dangle said the doctor when he had brought this chapter of history up to date because it seems to me you are rollitt's chief accuser in this matter i wish i were able to feel that you were not personally interested in your charges proving to be true that of course does not affect the case as far as rollitt is concerned the evidence against him is merely conjecture so far but i met him at fisher's door that afternoon said dangle determined to make the most of his strong points why said fisher you told me you didn't know which my door was when you first spoke about it i found out since and it was the same door was he coming out of the room or going in coming out you are sure of that yes i remember because the door nearly struck me as he opened it however could it do that exclaimed fisher my door opens inwards dangle coloured up with confusion and stammered i i thought it i, I suppose i was wrong i think so said the doctor frigidly thank you boys i needn't keep you longer at present you idiot said clapperton as he and the discomfited dangle walked back to forders you've made a precious mess of it and made the whole house ridiculous why couldn't you let it alone you've mulled everything you've put your finger into this term look here clapperton said dangle in a white heat i've stood a lot from you this term a jolly lot i've done your dirty work and 
what do you mean what dirty work have i asked you to do plenty that you've not had the pluck to do yourself i dare you to repeat it you liar you shall do your own in future i know that dangle hold your tongue you cat i shall do nothing of the kind you snob whereupon ensued the most wonderful spectacle of the half a fight between clapperton and dangle it was nearly dark and no one was about and history does not record how it ended but in hall that night both appeared with visages suspiciously marred and it was noted by many an observant eye that diplomatic relations between the two were suspended but while old friends had thus been falling out on rollitt's account old enemies had on the same grounds been making it up the juniors having recovered of their colds and finding themselves once more in the full possession of their appetite their liberty and their spirits celebrated their convalescence by a general melee in percy's room under the specious pretext of a committee meeting of the shop directors this business function being satisfactorily concluded they turned their attention to the condition of things in general that fellsgarth should have got itself into a regular mess during their enforced retirement caused them no surprise what else could any one expect but that any one should dare to suspect and make things hot for a fellow without consulting them caused them both pain and astonishment it quite slipped their memories that not long since some of them had been glad enough to listen to disparaging talk about the school hermit that was a detail on the whole they had stuck to him and they meant to stick to him now many things were in his favour he had won a goal for the school he had dispensed with his right to a fag and had let the juniors of all grades generally alone he was on nodding terms with fisher minor one of their lot he had come up hawk's pike at much personal inconvenience to look for them and he had been a customer to the extent of six abernathys at the school shop for all these reasons which were quite apart from party considerations it was decided nem con that rollitt was a good old sort and must be stuck by whereupon the nine of them sallied out arm in arm across the green on the lookout for some one who might hold a contrary opinion after some search they found a modern middle boy who catching sight of fisher minor shouted how now who nobbled the club money which made fisher minor suddenly detach himself from his company and shouting that's him start in pursuit what a bulldog it was getting to be sure the whole party joined in the hue and cry and might have run the fugitive down had not the headmaster stalked across the green at that moment on his way to mr wakefield's at sight of him they pulled up short looked unutterably amiable doffed their caps and made as though they were merely out to take the air on this beautiful november afternoon to fisher minor the interruption was a sad one that fellow was the borrower of his half-crown for weeks he had lost sight of him now suddenly chance had seemed to bring both man and money within reach when alas the harpy swooped down and took off the prize from under his very nose the doctor having passed they continued their search for any one who had a bad word to say for rollitt but as it was nearly dark and rain was falling the craven maligners kept indoors and would not be caught so the juniors relieved themselves by giving three cheers for rollitt under every window round the green and then fell to abusing fisher minor because his brother fisher major had lost the money which rollitt was said to have stolen there's no doubt that kid's at the bottom of it said percy first of all he's a classy cad here the speaker was obliged to pause on a friendly admonition from the boot of his brother wally he's a classy kid continued he you said cad i said cad do you hear that you chaps thinks i don't know how to spell you said he was a classy cad there you are you've said it now kick him you chaps how dare he say he's a classy cad said percy this verbal squabble being settled at last percy proceeded to explain fisher minor's position if he hadn't come to fellsgarth rollitt would have been smashed to bits over the falls and if rollitt had been smashed to bits he couldn't have bought six abernethys at the shop suggested darcy right you are and what's more he couldn't have eaten them if he had and he couldn't have run away there you are i said this kid was at the bottom of it but who'd have collared the money in that case asked ashby percy reflected this was a decided point 
well you see said he it's this way if young fisher minor hadn't been born he wouldn't have had a governor and a mater and if he hadn't had a governor and a mater no more would fisher major and if fisher major hadn't had a governor and a mater he'd never have been elected treasurer and if he'd not been elected treasurer he wouldn't have lost the money so you see the young uns at the bottom of it again i know a shorter way than that said d'arcy if young fisher minor hadn't fetched rollitt up to vote that day fisher major wouldn't have been elected and then he couldn't have lost the money isn't that what i said said percy indignant to be thus summarily paraphrased are you going to lick me for being born inquired fisher minor good mind too it's all your fault good old rollitt's gone those six abernethys won't last him long suggested cash no we must keep a stock of them now and call them rollitt's particular i fancy they might fetch three halfpence each i say said wally i vote we find rollitt he's not a bad sort you know all very well said percy if one only knew where to look it's my notion he's either gone home or to the top of hawk's pike i don't well see where else he could be london suggested cottle not got the money walk there not got the boots he can't be hanging about near here everybody knows him no you bet he's gone to the top of hawk's pike and he's going to stay there till the clouds roll by this brought up a painful reminiscence none of the party except wally exactly favoured the idea of another attempt on the great mountain tell you what said percy those biscuits will last him over to-night we'll see if there's any news of him in the morning and if not we'll organise an expedition to find him i say let's go and have another shop committee somewhere where suppose we have it in rollitt's study he was a jolly good sort you know it would please him the logic of this proposition did not detain the meeting they decided to go in the usual way that is the four classic boys boldly marched into their house together and the five moderns dropped in one by one artlessly and quite by accident as fisher minor passed his brother's door he thought he would just look in at the same moment the house matron with a very important face was bounding into the room master fisher said she mrs wisdom's just sent back that flannel shirt of yours oh at last she's only had it six weeks about long enough said fisher major i'd given it up for lost it got left at the bottom of the bag and she never noticed it till last night and what do you think master fisher there was this in the breast pocket and she handed him a little brown paper parcel fisher major snatched at it with an ejaculation more like horror than anything else and tore the paper open four sovereigns and some silver dropped on to the table why gasped he that's it i remember now i got it on the field just before the rendlesham match and stuck it in that pocket and it went clean out of my head oh my word what have i done what an awful mess i've made not even fisher minor stayed to dispute the statement but hurried off with the great news to the shop committee next door End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two coming to fisher major's discovery put the finishing touch to the discomfiture of the modern seniors and the manner in which they came by the news of it by no means tended to salve the wound which it inflicted the shop committee was so convulsed by the intelligence which fisher minor brought that they then and there promised themselves the pleasure of conveying the good news to rollitt's accusers in person they accordingly adjourned in a body to the modern side won't clapperton grin said percy i say you chaps we may as well let him have it one at a time then he'll hear it nine times over do you see i'll go first the idea seemed a good one but risky cottle calculated that after about the fourth time clapperton would be a little riled he therefore modestly proposed to follow percy cash and lickford competed smartly for the third place the former being successful ramshaw having to come fifth had decided misgivings as to the fun of the thing while the classic juniors declined to play unless all the others remained on the spot ready to back up in case of emergency 
it was also decided that for precautionary reasons the key of clapperton's door should be removed for the time being lest he should try to lock the good news out and that an interval of two minutes should be allowed to elapse between each messenger's announcement little dreaming of the exquisite torture being prepared for him clapperton sat in his study engaged in the farce of preparation he had plenty to think of besides lessons things had all gone wrong with him dangle and he had fought brinkman after his thrashing by quarter no longer counted fullerton had rebelled and was taking boys over every day to the enemy quarter had successfully defied his clapperton's authority and the junior snapped their fingers at him and yet clapperton had come up this term determined to lay himself out for his side and be the most popular prefect in fellsgarth his one comfort was that the classics were under a cloud too one of their number was a runaway thief and a stigma rested on their side worse than any that attached to the moderns he was trying to make the most of this questionable consolation when the door opened and percy bounced in i say clapperton fisher's found the money rollitt's not a thief ain't you glad hooray and without waiting he retired as suddenly as he had come clapperton gaped at the door by which he had gone in amazement he had never calculated on this this was the worst thing yet it showed york had been right and that he and dangle the door opened again and connell ran in hooray clapperton the money's found while it's no thief ain't you glad and he too vanished there must be something in it what a fool he would look to all fellsgarth perhaps it was only a plot though to shield rollitt perhaps the door once more swung open and in jumped cash clapperton i say hooray that money's been found rollitt's no thief ain't you glad hello at this rate he would get to know the news how they would crow on the other side he wondered if fisher major had done it on perp again there was a scuffle of feet at the door and lickford stepped in oh clapperton he said hooray clapperton the money's turned up and rollitt's no thief ain't you glad and oh i say clapperton hooray come here said clapperton sternly but oh dear no lickford was pressed and couldn't stay the young asses growled clapperton why can't they keep their precious news to themselves if they tried they couldn't have made bigger nuisances of themselves i suppose now york will the door swung open again and ramshaw hanging on to the handle swung in with it hooray clapperton rollitt's no thief that money's turned up ain't you glad i am good evening this final greeting was cut short by a ruler which clapperton sent flying at the messenger's head ramshaw dodged in time and the ruler flew out into the passage where it was promptly captured by fisher minor whose turn came next thank goodness that's the end of the young cads growled clapperton they've done it on purpose and i'll pay them out for it that ass fisher major he's bound to here there came a modest tap at the door and fisher minor peeped in apologetically well what do you want you've no business on this side go to your own house all right clapperton said fisher speaking with unwonted rapidity i only thought you'd like to know my brother's found the money hooray rollitt's no thief ain't you glad yow this last exclamation was in response to a grab from the enraged clapperton which though it failed to catch the messenger clawed his face i've had enough of this said the senior i don't care hello where's my key the key was not to be seen he looked out into the passage it was not there no one else was in sight he returned viciously to his seat at the table and began to read again the door had opened and ashby on tiptoe was in the room before the senior noticed the fresh intrusion rollitt's no thief ain't you glad the money's found hooray clapperton done it exclaimed ashby all in one breath dancing out of the room in conscious pride at his exploit all very well said d'arcy whose turn came next how am i to do it no shirking said wally i come after you look here said d'arcy if you chaps give me a leg up i'll let him have it through his window i can reach round from this passage window to his if you hang on to my legs good dodge said wally admiringly but we'd better turn the key on the door first if he came out and spotted us holding you we might have to drop you so the key was quietly put in the lock and turned and d'arcy firmly held by the heels wriggled himself out of the window and with the aid of a pipe pulled himself up with his face to the window of clapperton's study that worthy was beginning to congratulate himself that he would be spared a further 
repetition of the uncomfortable news that night when a sudden loud voice at one of the open lattice panes almost startled him out of his skin oh clapperton ain't you glad rollitt's no thief the money's found good evening have you used our soap paul in you chaps sharp the persecuted senior after the first surprise made a frantic rush first at the window and then finding the bird flown at the door the latter was locked he could hear a scuffling and scrambling in the lobby outside followed by a stampede after which dead silence prevailed save for the vicious kicking of the imprisoned hero at his own door phew said wally fanning himself when the juniors were safe back in percy's study that was a squeak if you like how on earth am i to do it better let him off suggested some one wally resented the suggestion as an insult not likely said he i'll do it i don't care if you all back up and in a minute when the sound of the kicking had ceased and clapperton had apparently retired once more to his work he crept out into the lobby followed stealthily by the whole band as they passed the head of the stairs whose voice should they hear below inquiring of a middle boy if clapperton was in the house but the doctor's yes sir shall i tell him you want him said the boy no i'll go up to his room said the headmaster phew said wally what a go and the door's locked on the outside i'll go and turn it quietly said percy if you back up in case he flies out but the precaution was not needed percy who luckily had just taken off his boots slipped up silently to the door and the others from their lurking-place saw him quietly turn the key and then walk back evidently unheard by the prisoner within he passed the stairhead just before the doctor came up and to their great relief ran into the arms of his friends unchallenged the doctor indeed was too preoccupied to dream that as he went to clapperton's study nine small heads were craning out of a door at the end of the passage watching his every step i say whispered ashby in tones of horror suppose clap thinks it's one of us and goes for him my eye what a go ejaculated cash they saw the stately figure stand a moment at the door and turn the handle next moment he reeled back with an exclamation of amazement nearly fell to the ground by a bulky dictionary hurled at his head the nine lurkers fairly embraced one another in horror at the sight of this awful outrage and when a moment after they saw the doctor gather himself together and return to the charge this time closing the door behind him they did not envy the unlucky clapperton the awkward five minutes in store for him how the two arranged matters no one could say but as no sounds of violence issued and the doctor did not summon any one to fetch his cane they concluded clapperton had offered a sufficiently humble apology for his mistake hold on now said wally after three minutes had passed i'll try it now it's my only chance you classic kids be ready to cut home with me as soon as i come back so starting at a run like one who had come a long distance and expected to find the senior alone he dashed unceremoniously into clapperton's study of course not appearing to notice the distinguished company present crying i say clapperton hooray the money's found rollitt's no thief ain't you glad oh the doctor i beg your pardon sir the next moment he darcy ashby and fisher minor were descending the stairs three steps at a time on the way back to mr wakefield's as fast as their legs would carry them and with all the righteous satisfaction of men who had done their duty at all costs i reckon said wally he pretty well knows about it now and if he don't the doctor will rub it in the unfortunate clapperton indeed required no one to rub in the fact that he had made a mess of things the doctor did not attempt to do it he merely carried the news of the finding of the money and desired clapperton as the head of the house to make it known as widely as possible i say nothing now of the cruel wrong which has been inflicted by hasty suspicion on rollitt that shadow is still on the school but the worst shadow that a fellsgarth boy was a thief is happily removed and i wish every boy in this house to hear of it at the earliest possible moment and the doctor went leaving clapperton to gulp down the bitter pill as best he could why should he have the job to do he had not been the first to start the suspicions dangle had done that dangle with whom he had fought why should not dangle be called upon to put it right unluckily dangle was not the captain of forders he was not as responsible in starting the rumour as clapperton in his position had been in adopting it it was more than he could bring himself to to summon the house and announce the news publicly 
if dangle and brinkman had been with him still the three of them together might have brazened it out but his colleagues were sulking in their own quarters and whatever had to be done must be done single-handed he therefore sat down in no very happy frame of mind and wrote out the following curt notice for the house boards notice the headmaster wishes it to be known that the club money supposed to be missing has been found by the treasurer george clapperton this ungracious document he copied out three times and taking advantage of every one being in his study for preparation affixed with his own hand on the notice-boards at the house-door and on each landing there said he with a sneer of disgust as he returned to his own room let them make the most of that an hour later the dormitory bell sounded and he could hear the scuffling of feet on the lobby outside and the clamour of voices as boys hustled one another in front of the boards evidently the majority regarded the announcement in a jocular manner and when a distant shout of laughter came up from the passage below and down from the landing above it was clear that forders did not take the matter very much to heart it was ridiculous when you come to think of it soliloquized clapperton that a blundering ass like fisher major should have brought the school into such a precious mess the noise gradually died away as fellows one by one dropped off to bed clapperton waited till they were gone before he followed as he passed the notice-board he glanced at the document which had lately cost him so much pain it was still there but not as he left it a sentence had been squeezed in between his own words and his signature at the bottom of the sheet which as it was a fair imitation of his back-sloped handwriting had all the appearance of forming part of his manifesto clapperton gasped with fury as he read the amended notice notice the headmaster wishes it to be known that the club money supposed to be missing has been found by the treasurer and that i am a beast and a sneak to have accused rollitt of stealing it george clapperton he tore the paper from the board and stamped on it in his rage then he went downstairs to look at the notice on the school door it read precisely like the other the imitation being perhaps better he stayed only to tear this down and proceeded to the other landing where the same insult confronted him who the author might be he was free to guess as he lay awake that night tossing and turning he racked his brain to devise some retribution and yet his more sensible self told him hadn't he been leading up to this all the term what had he done to make the fellows respect much more like him he had bullied and swaggered and set himself against the good of the school the fellows who followed him only did so in the hope of getting something either fun or advantage out of the agitation they didn't care tuppence about clapperton and were ready enough to drop him as soon as ever it suited their turn the one or two things he could do well and for which anybody respected him as for instance football he had deliberately shut himself off from leaving his authority to depend only on the very qualities he had least cause to be proud of it was easy enough to say that brinkman and dangle cut even a poorer figure over this wretched business than he but who troubled their heads about brinkman and dangle the former had already been snuffed out hopelessly and dared not show his face dangle as everybody knew had a personal grudge against rollitt and was unhampered by scruples as to how he scored but he clapperton he had always tried to pose as a decent sort of fellow with some kind of interest in the good of the school and some sort of notion about common honour and decency ugh this was what had come of it as he lay awake that night the sound of the laughter round the notice-boards and the ain't you glad of the juniors dinned in his ears sometimes infuriating sometimes humiliating him but in either case mockingly reminding him that clapperton's greatest enemy in fellsgarth was the captain of the modern side next morning brought no news of the missing boy and a vague feeling of anxiety spread through the school boys remembered how proud and sensitive rollitt had been and how dreadful was the accusation against him suppose he had done something desperate he had cared little enough for danger when all went well would he be likely to care more now that the school was in league against him pointing to him as a thief and hounding him out of its society all sorts of dreadful possibilities occurred both to masters and boys and all the while a feeling of fierce resentment was growing against the fellows whose accusations had been the cause of all the mischief dangle as he crossed the green to class was hooted all the way brinkman was followed about with derisive cheers and cries of look out quarter is coming 
and clapperton when he appeared was silently cut fellows went out of the way to avoid him and the chair on either side of him was left vacant in hall did you hear said ramshaw to his neighbour at the prefect's table at dinner-time that they've begun to drag the lake to-day a grim silence greeted the question fellows tried to go on with their meal but somehow ramshaw had destroyed every one's appetite nonsense said york he took food with him you forget that that looks as if he'd gone off the beaten track somewhere said fullerton it does and hawk's pike is as likely a place as any other said york Phew there was frost on it the other night some one said i wish the doctor would let us go out and look for him we've a much better chance of finding him than police and guides here the signal was given to rise and every one dispersed york stayed one of the last as he went out he caught sight of a solitary figure walking moodily ahead with hands dug in pockets and head down the picture of dejection york could hardly recognize in this back view his old rival and enemy clapperton yet he it was a few weeks ago and he always marched to and from his house in the boisterous company of friends and admirers now he was left alone a flush of something like shame mounted to the captain's cheeks he had no love for this fellow he owed him little gratitude and yet the sight of him thus solitary cut off from the stream stirred him did he not try in his humble way to follow in the footsteps of one who said love your enemies do good to them that hate you and was not this an opportunity for putting that faith of his to the test of practice he quickened his pace and overtook clapperton the modern senior wheeled round half savagely clapperton said the captain we've been enemies all this term i've thought harshly of you and you've thought harshly of me why shouldn't we be friends what almost growled clapperton are you making a fool of me no but we've tried hating one another long enough let's try being friends for a change they stood facing one another the one serene honest inviting the other dejected and doubting but as their eyes met the fires kindled again in clapperton's face and the cloud swept off his brow he pulled his hand from his pocket and held it out done with you york you're the last fellow in fellsgarth i expected to call friend just now End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three the voyage of the cock house york was roused before daybreak next morning by a voice at his bedside is that you york the voice was mr stratton's the captain bounded to his feet at once what is it sir has he been found no said the master no news every place has been searched where he would be likely to be except the mountain it seems a very off chance that he has gone up there still it is possible he has been on it once or twice before i am going there now would you care to come too the captain gratefully acquiesced for a week he had been chafing at the doctor's orders that no boy should go beyond the bounds his request to be allowed to undertake this very expedition had been twice refused already the doctor has given you an exeat if you wish to go said mr stratton we are to take a guide and it is quite understood we may be late in getting back i shall be glad of your company york was ready in ten minutes thankful at last to be allowed to do something yet secretly doubting if anything would come of this forlorn quest apart from rollitt however good did come of it to fellsgarth for during the long walk master and boy got to understand one another better than ever before with a common ambition for the welfare of the school and a common trouble at the dissensions which had split it up during the present term they also discovered a common hope for better times ahead they discussed all sorts of plans and exchanged confidences about all sorts of difficulties and all the while they felt drawn 
close to one another exchanging the ordinary relations of master and boy for those of friend and friend some of my readers may say that mr stratton must have been a very foolish master to give himself away to a boy or that york must have been a very presuming boy to talk so familiarly to a master who cares what they were if they and fellsgarth were the better for that morning's walk in many ways said mr stratton the head boy has as much responsibility for the good of a school as a headmaster always more than an assistant master you could wreck the school in a week if you chose and it is in your hands to pull it together more than any of us masters however much we should like to do it and you'll do it old fellow and so they turned up the lane that led round to the back of the mountain the news that mr stratton and the captain had gone up hawk's pike to look for rollitt soon spread through fellsgarth that morning the souls of our friends the juniors were seriously stirred by it their promise or shall we say threat to organize a search party up the mountain on their own account had been lost sight of somewhat in the exciting distractions of the last twenty-four hours but now that they found the ground cut from under their feet they were very indignant secretly no doubt they were a little relieved to find that they had been forestalled in the perilous venture of a winter ascent of the formidable pike they had such good cause to remember it was a mean trick of york's to chouse them out of the credit they protested now he would get all the glory and they would get none i tell you what said percy it's my notion rollitt's not gone up the mountain at all it's just a dodge of those two to get a jolly good spree for themselves pooh they'll get lost we shall have to go and look for them most likely and then said lickford somebody will have to come and look for us and rollitt's not here to do it said fisher minor this cast the company back on to their original subject it's my notion said wally he's got on the island in the middle of the lake like robinson crusoe rather a lark said ashby to get up a search party and go and look for him there the idea took wonderfully to-day was founder's day a whole holiday they would certainly go and look for rollitt on the island the preparations disclosed an odd conception on the part of the explorers of the serious nature of their quest their stated object was to rescue a lost schoolfellow why therefore did they decide to take nine pennyworth of brandy balls a football a pair of boxing gloves and other articles of luxury not usually held to be necessary to the equipment of a relief expedition as regards food they possessed too keen a recollection of the straits they had been put to up the mountain a few weeks ago to neglect that important consideration now naturally ham and abernethys were the victuals selected had not rollitt made these classical as the staff of life during voluntary exile from school they were compelled to put up with a very small sample of the former lickford had been bequeathed a bone by his senior yesterday to which adhered a few fragments of a once small ham possibly it might with careful carving furnish nine small slices it was better than nothing they would make up for its deficiency by a double lot of abernethys so they trooped off to the shop according to their own rules this establishment was only open between eleven and twelve in the morning and not at all on holidays but another rule said that the committee might in certain cases suspend or alter the rules whereupon percy moved and ashby seconded the following resolution that this shop be and is hereby opened for the space of five minutes the motion was carried unanimously 
d'arcy and cottle whose turn it was to be on duty solemnly took down the shutters and ranged themselves behind the counter what can i do for you my little dears said the former encouragingly money down no tick try some of our rollets particular three halfpence each no they're not you cheat they're a penny we'd better have two each said wally hello i say exclaimed d'arcy look here you fellows he pointed to the heap of abernethy biscuits on the top of which lay a sixpence that's what you call looking after the money said wally left that there all night no not a bit of it but i tell you what said d'arcy who had rapidly been counting the pile of biscuits there were twenty-four biscuits there when we left last night i'm certain of it weren't there young cottle yes i remember that testified cottle very well then some one's been here in the night for there are only eighteen biscuits now and this sixpence perhaps york got some before he started how could he no one can get in here without the latch-key and only the two chaps who are on duty keep that perhaps it's the owls in the belfry they don't generally pay ready money for what they take i say exclaimed wally i expect it's rollitt he'd have finished his others by this time and he sneaked back in the night for some more good old rollitt wally did not stay to explain how rollitt could have got in any more than any one else his suggestion made a deep impression it touched them to feel that amid all his distresses rollitt was loyal to the school shop and if anything was needed to spur them on to his rescue this did it they bought up the remaining eighteen biscuits between them and sallied forth you see said wally it's much more likely to be the island than the mountain there's water there for one thing there's water on the mountain said ashby plenty but not good to drink you ass argued wally and there's that old broken boat-house to live in and lots of wood to make fires and ducks to bag and fish to catch i say i expect he's having rather a lark the prospect of sharing in his wild sports urged them on still faster at the lakeside a new problem arose if rollitt was on the island how had he got there and still more important how were they to get there widow wisdom's boat had already been laid up for the winter and the few others which in the summer were generally kept at the river mouth for the use of the boys had been taken back to penchurch the only craft available was a flat-bottomed punt used by fishermen and at present moored to a stake at the river-bank it was capacious certainly but not exactly the sort of boat in which to get up much pace particularly as its sole apparent mode of propulsion was by means of two very long boat-hooks one on either side these details however presented few obstacles to the minds of the enterprising explorers the punt was in many ways adapted for a voyage such as they proposed to take there was room to walk about in it nay who should say the boxing-gloves and football might not have scope for themselves within its ample lines the one question was whether the boat-hooks were long enough to touch bottom all the way from the shore to the island wally paced one and found it measured eighteen feet ought to do said he it's bound not to be deeper than that so the punt which was christened the cock house for the occasion was loosed from her moorings the abernethys and knucklebone and other stores were put on board the boat-hooks by a combined effort were got into position and the party embarked for the rescue of rollitt thanks to the stream their progress at first was satisfactory they were delighted to find how easily they went wally with one boat-hook on one side and percy with the other on the other side had comparatively little to do except to prevent their hooks getting stuck in the mud at the bottom and refusing to come out any one watching them would have said these boys had been born in a barge they carried their long poles to the prow and plunged them in there with a mighty splash then they shoved away till the end of the poles came within reach of their hands then in perfect step and time they started to march each down his own side of the boat calling on their friends and admirers to get out of the way 
then as they neared the stern and the prospect of pulling up their hooks and returning forward for another punt loomed ahead their faces grew anxious and concerned they began to hold on hard all a yard from the end of the walk and tug frantically to get themselves free sometimes the hook came out easily in which case they fell backwards into the arms of their friends at other times it stuck and they had to detain the progress of the boat a minute or more to get it out and sometimes it all but escaped them and continued sticking up out of the water while the barge itself floated on happily the last tragedy never quite came off although it was periodically imminent when however the stream opened into the lake the progress became much less exciting the water was a little lumpy and had a tendency while they were walking back at the end of one punt in order to start another of jumping the cock-house back into precisely the same position from which he had lately started after about half an hour's fruitless efforts the twins were seized with a generous desire not to monopolize the whole of the fun of the voyage like to have a go said wally to d'arcy you may have a turn if you like lick said percy whereupon d'arcy and lickford took up the rowing for the cock-house greatly assisted and enlivened in their operations by the advice and encouragement of the late navigators two to one on lick cried wally as the two started their mad career down the boat look out he's gaining you've made her go an inch and a half said percy hang on tight now and pull it up said wally as lickford red in the face with excitement was straining himself to release the hook from the mud keep her trim said percy laying hold of d'arcy's feet as the latter was gradually letting himself be hauled out of the boat by his refractory pole in due time d'arcy and lickford unselfishly gave up the poles to coddle and ashby and they after a reasonable season of struggle and peril nobly ceded them to ramshaw and cash fisher minor waiving his claim and electing to sit odd man out and steer as at the end of an hour and a half's manful shoving the net progress made was a yard back into the stream of the river the talents of the helmsman were not put to a very severe test i say it's rather slow said wally let's have some of rollitt's particular so while percy with a small pair of scissors none of the party marvellous to relate had brought a knife was carving the remnant of ham and ashby was counting out nine brandy balls from the bag each member of the party produced one of his abernethys and fell to with all the appetite that waits on hard and honest toil not much of a pace yet remarked d'arcy why we're going better now we've stopped rowing than we were before that's because the wind's changed said wally if we'd only got a sail we could make her go why not stick up the two poles and fasten our coats or something between for a sail suggested percy good idea the poles are long enough for all the nine one of em can go through right sleeves and the other through left it'll make a ripping sail so despite the season of the year the nine voyagers divested themselves of their coats which were industriously threaded by the sleeves on either pole the top coat was spiked by the hooks and those below were ingeniously buttoned one to the other to keep them up every one agreed it made a ripping sail the difficulty was to hoist it there were no holes in which to fix the parallel masts they would have to be held in position as the breeze was stiffening and it required all hands aloft at length by superhuman exertions the complex fabric was slowly hoisted to the perpendicular looking very like a ladder up which nine scarecrows were clamouring however no matter what it looked like now as wally predicted they'd spank along we're going already gasped he panting with the exertion of holding up his mast look out now here's a nice breeze coming he was right next moment the vast foresail fell with a run by the board and the nine athletes below were nearly shot into the air by the force of the collapse the coats fortunately held together sufficiently well to enable them to be hauled on board in a piece but as they were soaked through they afforded very little comfort to the distressed seamen who decided forthwith to shorten sail at once and take to the poles once more 
but by this time the cock-house thanks to the tremendous impetus it had just received was twenty yards from the shore and wally when he put down his pole nearly went after it in the vain search for a bottom here's a go said he i say you chaps i almost fancy after all rollitt must be up the mountain what do you say i thought so all along said fisher minor if he is york and stratton will find him good old york i say we may as well back water a bit easier said than done the old punt now she was once out on the vasty deep behaved pretty much as she and the wind between them pleased for a time it looked very much as if after all the explorers would reach their destination but presently just indeed as the explorers had started a small football match association rules classics against moderns to keep themselves warm the fickle breeze shifted and sent the cock-house lumbering inshore a mile or so north of the river mouth the classics had just scored their one hundred and fourteenth goal as she grounded and it was declared by common consent that the voyage was at an end luckily she came ashore near to a little creek into which by prodigious haulings and shovings she was turned and here in a rude way they succeeded in mooring her until a more convenient season the call over bell was just beginning to ring when the nine mariners got back to fellsgarth great cheering was going on on the green and boys were crowding together discussing some great news what is it rollitt turned up asked the juniors no haven't you heard york and stratton went up to look for him on hawk's pike they didn't find him but they got to the top got to the top one of our chaps got to the top of hawk's pike hurroo yell you chaps bravo york bully for a fellsgarth i wish they'd found rollitt all the same said fisher minor i'm afraid he's gone for good not he didn't we nearly find him to-day you young muff retorted wally besides a fellow who's gone for good would come and buy sixpenny worth of abernethys at our shop in the night would he fisher minor took what comfort he could from the assurance and trooped in with his fellow adventurers to call over End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four bury the hatchet notwithstanding york's exploit and the prevailing hopefulness of the juniors the feeling of gloom deepened on fellsgarth when another day ended and no news was forthcoming of the lost boy to a great many it was a shock to hear he was not on the mountain from what was known of his eccentricities and recklessness it seemed as likely as not he would retreat up there and remain till he was fetched down when it was found he was not there there seemed to be nowhere else left to look the lake quite independently of the eventful cruise of the cock-house had been thoroughly searched penchurch had been ransacked every cottage and home in the neighbourhood had been called at the river banks up and down stream had been searched to and daily communication with rollitt's home made it increasingly clear he had not gone there the incident of the six abernethys and the sixpence was not seriously considered there was no evidence that rollitt had effected the mysterious purchase and the eccentricities of the young shopman left it very doubtful whether more than half of that story was not a sensational fiction of their own masters and boys alike went to bed full of trouble and foreboding fisher major more perhaps than any one took the situation to heart he had never ranged himself with rollitt's accuser yet had it not been for his bad management and stupidity all the trouble would never have come about now if anything grave had happened to the missing boy fisher major felt that on his shoulders rested all the blame but his misery was turned into rage when just before bedtime a fag came over with the following letter from dangle i am not surprised you should be so ready to be imposed upon you have done mischief enough already 
but you have been robbed all the same any one but a simpleton would see that the turning up of the money just when it did was a suspicious coincidence what could be easier than for the thief either to impose on widow wisdom and get her to bring back the money with the story about the shirt or else during one of his frequent visits there as soon as he saw that he was found out to slip it into the pocket himself where he got it from i don't pretend to guess but i don't mind betting that somebody in the school is poor by four pounds ten shillings for this tardy act of restitution it deceived no one but you none are so blind etc r dangle fisher fairly tore his hair over this scoundrelly document his impulse was to go over then and there drag the writer out of his bed and make him literally swallow his own words he might have done it had not the captain just then looked in why what's up said the latter who seemed none the worse for his big climb what's the matter matter read this shouted fisher yorke read the letter an angry flush spread over his face as he did so he shall answer for it to-night said fisher no not to-night let the cad have a night's rest he shall answer for it to-morrow though before the whole school let me have the letter old man if you'll promise to make him smart for it you can make your mind easy about that next morning to the surprise of every one a notice appeared on the door of each house notice a school meeting is summoned for this afternoon at three signed c york wakefields g clapperton forders p bingham stratton's l porter will brahams what's up now said wally as he read it like clapperton's cheek to go sticking his name under our man's and old bingham too what right has he to stick his nose in it and ha ha porter that's the green idiot in specs who calls himself captain of will brahams well i never shall you go asked d'arcy rather wonder what they're up to though perhaps rollitt's found and they're going to trot him out perhaps they're going to have an eight-handed mill those four you know like what we had i know when you rammed me below the belt said coddle crams you know i played on your third waistcoat button i was never below it once perhaps york's going to give a lecture on the ascent of hawk's pike i know what it is they're going to give the chaps back their subscriptions what a run they'll be on the shop directly after this last rumour was industriously put about by the juniors and was believed in a good many quarters a new diversion however served to put aside speculation for a time hello who's that lout asked d'arcy as he and wally having shaken off the others for a season were taking a cool arm in arm near the playing-field gate the object of this remark was a stalwart middle-aged labouring man who carried an american cloth bag in his hand and to judge by the mud on his garments had travelled some distance he was trying to open the gate into the field and on seeing our two juniors beckoned to them inquiringly you can't get in there said wally you'll have to go to the other gate at the watch-tower is this here fellsgar school young master said the man rather replied wally is the governor at home who ringwood i don't know they'll tell you at the gate he's come to mend the door of your young brother's room i expect said d'arcy i hope he won't bung up the squirt hole while he's about it no i say carpenter said wally as the man was about to turn off in the direction of the other gate when you mend that door in forders make it strong do you hear it gets kicked at rather by fellows and don't bung carpenter i ain't no carpenter i want to see the governor gruffly as the man spoke he evidently regarded the two young gentlemen as persons of some distinction and lingered a moment longer to ask another question beg your pardon young gents said he but you don't chance to know if alf rollitt has come back they gazed at him in amazement rollitt no do you know where he is i say not come back said the man hoarsely i made sure as he'd be back afore now do you know where he is repeated wally not me 
he's bound to be somewheres but the missus she wouldn't rest till i come and see the missus i say do you know rollitt well they do say it's a wise father as don't know his own child what are you rollitt's father asked they glancing involuntarily at the shabby clothes and rough weather-beaten face nothing to be ashamed of are it said the stranger tain't my alf's fault i ain't in gents togs this rebuke abashed our two juniors considerably rather not said wally our lot's backing rollitt up you know we've been out to look for him haven't we d'arcy of course we have good old rollitt said d'arcy thank you kindly young gents said mr rollitt who seemed rather dazed i ain't no scholar nor no gent either but my boy alf's a good boy and he don't mean no disrespect to the likes of you by running away he's bound to be somewheres i say said wally if you come round to the other gate you can get in we'll show you where ringwood's house is tell you what said he to d'arcy as the two boys went back by the field to meet him he doesn't seem a bad sort of chap it won't do to let my young brother percy and those modern cads get hold of him i vote we nurse him on our side while he's here all serene said d'arcy ask him to tea after the meeting i suppose we shall have to let those other chaps be in it too suggested wally dubiously after a moment better we'll all see him through together the spectacle of two juniors looking very important carefully conducting an anxious-faced labouring man across the school green was enough to rouse a little curiosity and when presently the bodyguard after sundry whispered communications increased from two to nine who marched three in front two behind and two on either side of their celebrity speculation became active and warm the escort glared defiantly at any one who ventured to approach the group but when it was observed that they made straight for the doctor's house and one by one shook hands with the visitor on the doorstep there was very little doubt left as to who the stranger might be mind you come to tea said wally as they parted don't you make no mistake i'll be there said the guest work in school that morning dragged heavily the impending meeting was perplexing the minds of not a few the phenomenon of york's and clapperton's names appended to the same document puzzled boys who still kept alive the animosity which had wrecked the school clubs earlier in the term and brought the sports to a deadlock and the addition of the names of the captains of the other two houses made it evident that the whole school was concerned in the business this coupled with the mystery of rollitt's disappearance and the now notorious internecine feuds of the modern seniors gave promise of one of the biggest meetings ever held in hall as to the juniors they had a treble care on their mind first the meeting and the expected refunding of the club subscriptions second the consequent run on the shop and third the small and early in wally's study afterwards to meet a rollitt senior esq however despite all these cares the morning's work was got through the dreaded impositions were avoided and when the midday meal was ended a general rush was made for the familiar benches in hall the state of doubt every one was in operated adversely to the usual cheering fellows didn't know whom they were expected to cheer dangle for instance pale and sullen were the moderns expected to cheer him the classics hissed him which was one reason why his own house should applaud but then if they cheered dangle how should they do about clapperton who had fought dangle a week ago they got over the difficulty by doing neither but starting party cries which they could safely cheer and chaffing everybody all round punctually at three york rose and said they no doubt were curious to know what the meeting was called for it was called for one or two purposes the first was to see if they could revive the school clubs cheers he wasn't going to say a word of ancient history laughter but as they stood now they had a lot of fellows anxious to play they had the materials for as good a 
fifteen this winter and as good an eleven next spring cheers as any school in the country and yet the playing fields stood idle and the name of fellsgarth was dropping out of all the records they had had enough of that sort of thing every one was sick of it fellows had agreed with him when it was proposed to disband the clubs he hoped they would agree with him now that the time had come for reviving them but there was to be a difference the clubs were not to be open to everybody as heretofore they didn't want everybody here here from wally darcy ashby and fisher as they pointed across to the modern juniors they only wanted fellows who would play and could play as to the former that of course would be decided by the fellow himself who would send in an application to the committee as to the latter that would be decided by the captain oh yes by the captain what's the good of a captain if he's not to decide a matter like that and if the fellow is not satisfied with the captain's decision he may appeal to mr stratton the new president of the club cheers there's nothing to prevent any one who plays his best joining there's nothing to prevent those youngsters at the end of the room who are kicking up such a row joining the clubs as long as they work hard in the field cheers and laughter the fellows who won't be eligible are the louts and those who can play but won't loud cheers clapperton rose to second the motion he had lost a great deal of his side during the last few days and though he looked in better tiff than he had done lately the present occasion was evidently an effort he said yorke has made a generous speech he avoided ancient history and therefore did not go into the reason why the clubs were dissolved and the school sports came to smash i could tell you but what's the use you all know yorke said to me before the meeting let bygones be bygones old man we were all to blame bury the hatchet let's get right for the future gentlemen there was one fellow who was not to blame his name was not clapperton it was york loud cheers but i say with him if you let me bury the hatchet cheers and to prove it i beg to hand in my name to the committee for election i answer for myself that i am willing to play and if the captain decides that i can play laughter why i will play loud applause fullerton and corder both sprang up to support the motion the former made way for corder who merely wished to say how delighted he was he also voted for the burying of the hatchet he had minded being stopped football more than anything else he gave in his name he would play and he might tell them that the captain had already told him he could play laughter and cries of blow your own trumpet all right it was the only thing he had to be cocky about and he meant to be cocky he supported the motion cheers fullerton handed in his name and was very glad to think that he and his old friend clapperton would have a chance of running up the field again together if you're elected from the end of the room and laughter oh of course if he was elected he hoped when the gentleman down there was captain fifty years hence he would deal as liberally with candidates as he was sure york would deal now laughter at wally's expense the other prefects followed suit and gave in their allegiance to the new clubs curiosity was alive to see what attitude brinkman and dangle would adopt for a while it seemed as if they would take no part but at length when york was about to put the motion brinkman rose and said i made up my mind when i came here i'd have no more to do with the clubs but york's bury the hatchet gives a fellow a chance if you mean that yes yes if this is a fresh start here's my name loud cheers you needn't cheer i didn't mean to give it but now i have i i won't shirk it and he sat down hurriedly then dangle rose with a sneer on his face this sort of thing is infectious i can't feel quite so sure as some of you about burying the hatchet but not to be peculiar you may put me down and i can tell you at once and before all these fellows said york rising hotly and interrupting that we won't have you and that brings me to the other business and that's about rollitt 
we can't bury the hatchet so easily as far as he is concerned for he is still absent and no one knows what has become of him i'm not going to say a word to make little of fisher major's mistake it was bad enough in all conscience for rollitt but it was only a mistake but what do you fellows say of the cad who deliberately gets up a story about him and even when he finds out there is not a shadow of truth in it repeats it in a worse form than before there are some here who believed the first report and joined in the suspicions that was hardly to be wondered at but every one of them had the decency as soon as the money was found to admit that they had been wrong and to regret their unfair suspicion of a fellsgarth fellow all but one this cad here only last night you fellows he wrote the letter i hold in my hand i mean to read it to you and i hope you won't forget it in a hurry you shan't read it it wasn't to you said dangle making a rush at the paper give it back you shall have it back said yorke in a warmer temper than any one had seen him in before when i've read it stop and listen to it it'll do you good read away sneered dangle giving up the contest it's the truth yorke read and as he proceeded shame and anger rose to boiling point in the audience so that towards the end the reader's voice was almost drowned in the hisses there said the captain crumpling up the paper in his hand and flinging it at the writer's feet there's your letter and until you apologize to the whole school you have insulted you needn't expect we'll bury the hatchet dangle scowled round and tried to swagger is that all the business he sneered no shouted some voices he ought to be kicked wait a bit cried wally excitedly standing on a form there's rollitt's governor just come some of our chaps have gone to fetch him he'll here the door opened and escorted by half a dozen of the juniors mr rollitt looking more bewildered than ever walked in he looked apologetically from one side to the other saying thank ye kindly and no offence young gents until he found himself at the end of the hall among the prefects then york got up again still hot with temper and a dead silence ensued dangle smiled at first but his face gradually blanched as he looked round and found his retreat cut off and guessed what was coming mr rollitt said york we are your son's schoolfellows a great wrong has been done him he has been suspected of being a thief and has run away we all now know that he's not a thief and we are ashamed that he has ever been suspected we hope he will come back so that we may tell him so but there is one fellow here who still says your son is a thief although he knows as well as we do he isn't what shall we do to him mr rollitt looked up and down casting a glance first at his young protectors at the end of the hall then scanning the benches before him then running his eye along the row of prefects and finally taking the measure of york as he stood and waited for an answer then suddenly the question seemed to come home my son alf a thief there's one of em says that is there my son alf a thief do to him why i'll tell you just keep him till my son alf comes back and make him go and say it to his face that's what i should do to him young gents that's what we will do said york the meeting is over and amid the excitement that ensued the rush to put down names for the new club the cheers and hootings and handshakings of old enemies mr rollitt was carried off in triumph by his nine hosts to high tea in wally wheatfield's room end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed 
this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five the watch-tower wally's study he always liked to call it a study but his friends preferred to call it a den could comfortably accommodate six the juniors had frequently to own that nine the normal size of the party was a jam when in addition to that a big brawny man was thrown in it came to be a serious question as to how the four walls would sustain the strain wally however was determined to manage somehow he indignantly rejected percy's offer to his more spacious apartment over the way no he had captured the lion he and d'arcy and they would entertain him in their own den after all it was not so bad it only meant letting the fire out and putting one chair in the fender and shoving the other end of the table which had been doubled in length by the addition of the table out of a neighbouring room that was within four inches of the same height close up against the door which it was just possible to shut as however the door opened outwards it was necessary for the gentleman occupying the foot of the table to sit out in the passage much to the inconvenience of the casual passers-by to a shy man like mr rollitt it was a difficult position to find himself the honoured guest of nine young gentlemen like these thank ye kindly young master said he when ashby relieved him of his hat and fisher minor of his bag and percy undermined him with a chair and coddle handed him the boy's own paper and cash came in with a hassock and d'arcy put a railway rug over his knees wally whose ideas of hospitality were of the old school deemed it expedient while tea was being served to engage his guest on the subject of the weather rather finer the last few days than it was the other week when it rained said he while it's having fine weather for his trip this was an artful way of introducing the topic of the hour thank you kindly yes he's bound to be somewheres is my alf replied mr rollitt it's all right we're backing him up he made a ripping run for the school against rendlesham he bashed the ball through the scrimmage you know and then nipped it up right under their noses and ran it through they couldn't collar him he bowled em over right and left and danced on em and landed the touch clean behind the post he meant no harm young gents didn't my alf he ain't often violent he ain't there's no offence i hope said the father quite overwhelmed by this alarming recital no it was a jolly good run you ought to have seen it i and my lot were up the oak you know we could have tucked you in my young brother percy and his modern cads kids i never can pronounce it were on the steps oh said the poor guest feeling he ought to reciprocate the civility of his entertainers steps is nice things to be on when you ain't got nowheres else tea shouted fisher minor who with ashby had been busily charging the table it was now the turn of the hosts to be shy at this late period of the term funds had run low and extras were at a premium a busy hour had been spent during the forenoon in both houses collecting outstanding debts contracting loans at the point of the sword and laying out the contents of the common purse at the shop in delicacies suitable to the occasion abernethys and ham of course figured prominently the cake and jam was rather a scratch lot as they mostly consisted of outsides and pot ends collected from various sources and amalgamated into one stock but to compensate for this wally had managed to get round the matron and by representing to her 
the delicate nature of the entertainment wheedled her out of a pot of extra special tea and a small jug of cream for the rest there were the relics of the cock-house commissariat a cocoa-nut generously contributed by fisher major and the usual allowance of bread and butter the principal delicacy of the feast however was contributed by a fair lady and to percy belonged the honour and glory of its acquisition on his way from hall he had run flop into the arms of mrs stratton who was carrying in her hands a small basket of hot-house grapes i'm awfully sorry i say mrs stratton said the culprit as the basket and its contents fell to the ground so am i said mrs stratton there's two bunches out of three not bashed said percy on his knees picking up the ruin i say mrs stratton if you'd let me pay for the other i can give you tuppence a week beginning next week i'd rather you know mrs stratton laughed pleasantly it was always a satisfaction she told her husband to come into collision with a junior he always got the best of it no thank you wheatfield but i tell you what you must do all serene mrs stratton said percy submissively preparing himself for a hundred lines at least one of the bunches is damaged you must take it and get your friends to help you eat it good-bye on the whole therefore the spread provided for mr rollitt was a respectable one and not likely to do discredit to his entertainers he was installed in the place of honour in the fender while occupying the seat in the passage the others ranging themselves on either side of the board they watched their guest's eye somewhat anxiously to detect in it any signs of predilection for any particular dish but he poor man was too bewildered by the novel experience he was undergoing to betray any symptoms of appetite what'll you have said percy presently well if you've got a bit of bread and cheese and a drop of something i don't mind thank you kindly this was rather a damper but wally was equal to the emergency have it abernethy that's what rollitt's been living on you'll like it we keep a stock in our shop only a penny each said ramshaw explanatorily better have some jam with it said cottle like some tea inquired d'arcy who had charge of the pot beginning to fill up a mug the size of the slop basin with the matron's extra special the cake's not so bad there's several lumps not a bit stale said ashby if you like cocoa-nuts said fisher minor my brother's lent us one and i'll cut you a chunk and there's some grapes for you when you're ready said percy proudly a present from a lady the awkward thing was that in their eagerness to see their guest eat none of the juniors took anything they continued to pile up the good man's plate till he didn't know where to begin and fairly bewildered him by each commending the excellence of his own particular delicacy thank ye young gents i ain't much of a eater when i'm away from home no more ain't my elf but i'll take a snack anyhow whereupon to their delight he commenced an onslaught on the viands before him every morsel he ate being followed by eighteen admiring eyes into his mouth he made short work of the abernethys and cake tossed off the tea as if it were a thimbleful jerked down the hunk of cocoa-nut gulped the grapes and generally gave the spectators an admirable and comprehensive performance they were charmed so much so that out of sheer pleasure they began to eat too the meal if brief was a merry one mr rollitt took a special fancy to the abernethys a choice which of course put the shop directors in an ecstasy they only reproached themselves that they had not provided twelve instead of six at length partly because there was nothing left but lukewarm water and the toughest crusts of the cake and partly because the guest's appetite was beginning to flag the solid portion of the meal came to an end and the social began 
after sundry nudgings and whisperings and signals among the juniors wally filled up his cup with warm water and rose to his feet ladies and gentlemen he said i you know that is shut up young cash unless you want to do it instead of me it's this way you see you chaps i sort of think we ought to drink the health of rollitt's governor he's a good old sort and we're backing up old rollitt it wasn't a very grand spread there'd have been some sardines if you'd come last week but that greedy pig d'arcy go on it was you finished them three in two gulps protested the outraged d'arcy look here young d'arcy said wally seriously am i making this speech or are you if you don't shut up i'll jolly well make you we hope you've liked it and don't mind our drinking your health you know it'll be jolly when old rollitt turns up we'd ask you again to-morrow you know only the grubs run short therefore i had much pleasure in proposing your health the toast was drunk with acclamation the party joining in for he's a jolly good fellow much to the alarm of the occupants of the neighbouring studies who flocked out in the passage to see what the noise was about wally assured them there was no grub left so they needn't hang about but a good many of them remained all the same to hear mr rollitt's speech thank ye kindly young masters began he with his usual formula i ain't no scholard like my alf is he could talk to you straight i'm sorry he ain't here gents he's bound to be somewheres and i'm sure it's no offence meant his going away i likes your style and i hopes that young fly-by-night who says my alf's a thief will tell him so to his face my alf'll settle him proper them as pays for my alf's schooling which it's two kind ladies masters as my missus was kinder foster sister to means to make a gent of my alf but bless you he'd sooner be along of me in the building trade not that my elf ain't a scholard and can't behave himself he do behave beautiful to his mother does alf and ain't nothing of a fine gent at home so there i tell you straight and no offence meant young masters i like your style i do don't you take on about my alf being a missing he's bound to be somewheres i knowed him do it afore when things went contrary but he wasn't fur off and come back only don't let him cop hold of that there jumper as says he's a thief or there'll be a row in the ouse why my elf's that straight he wouldn't rob a dog of his bone not if he was starving that's flat so here's to you young gents and if you happen to be passing near crackstone way me and my missus'll be proud to see yer here's luck the speech was rapturously applauded not only by the party present but by the knot of fellows in the passage who were taking advantage of the necessarily open door to join in the proceedings as outsiders wally however resented the intrusion and as soon as the speech of the evening was ended ordered one of the tables to be cleared and placing his chair upon it made room for the door to be closed on the intruders much to their disappointment after the favourable reception of his speech mr rollitt became very much more at home and produced a pipe from his pocket which he proceeded in the most natural way to light his hosts gazed in a somewhat awestruck way at the proceeding but wally gave the right cue that's right mr rollitt make yourself at home so i are you see in my days schooling warn't what it is now this here school must be a topper it's not bad said percy you see there was a jolly row on this term between the classics and our lot and they had to be taken down a bit did they retorted wally very indignant how many pigs did you come down who had to get our chaps to come and give them a leg up every other day who swindled the elections and got licked on the hands eh 
who got their football bag and couldn't get it back who got kicked out of the front row at the rendlesham match armony gents armony said mr rollitt waving his pipe encouragingly the rebuke was opportune it wasn't fair to the guest to squabble before him we've stashed all that said percy presently they got civil to us so we got civil to them and we're all in the shop together and we're all backing up old rollitt ain't we you chaps and we're going down in a lump for the clubs and we all shelled out for this do so it's all right now see mr rollitt thought he did and nodded amiably you see it's not much larks unless we're all in it we went up hawk's pike you know no said mr rollitt how did that happen well it was this way you see began percy taking up as was his wont the narrative at a remote period after those classy cads kids you know had shut up wally i said kids can't you spell had caved in who caved in expostulated the classics well after stratton's you know when we started the shop i say you'll have to come and see the shop well it was before that though it was when the row began about quarter not being stuck in that was before that you know brinkman screwed his foot so there was a man short for the team so clapperton that's our prefect you know he's all right now but he hello i say he's gone asleep sure enough mr rollitt weary with his long journey with the excitement of the day and with the excellence of the tea had dozed off comfortably on his chair in the fender with his pipe in his mouth percy felt it unnecessary to pursue his lucid narrative and the nine hosts sat watching their man as his head nodded forward and the urgent necessity for a snore presently rendered the position of the pipe no longer tenable it was a triumph no man could have gone off like that unless he had felt thoroughly comfortable the railway rug was again produced and laid over his knees and his feet were gently lifted on the hassock and a pillow was neatly inserted at the back of the chair and all looked so snug and the hospitable juniors were so pleased with the result that they had the vanity to let the door stand open so that all who passed by might see how comfortable they could make a guest when they liked to heighten the effect they decided to do their preparation on the spot and so not only impress the sleeper when he awoke but advertise themselves to the outside world as boys who by no means neglected the serious side of school life for its lighter functions it must be owned that next day when the work thus accomplished was subjected to the microscopic test of the master's eyes it was not any better some said it was even worse than usual that had nothing to do with the present wally who put his chair out again in the passage had most of his time occupied in making pantomimic appeals for silence from passers-by to whom he pointed out the figure of the sleeping mr rollitt as a justification the others debarred from speech for it was considered that even a whisper might awaken the sleeper although the violent process of tucking him up just now had failed to do so were reduced to communication with one another in writing which took up so much time and paper that very little of either was left for lessons at last after half an hour's suspense the clang of the house-bell for call-over broke the spell mr rollitt grunted and yawned and opened his eyes looked about for his pipe inspected the rug on his knees took his feet off the hassock and finally realized where he was i was nigh andy asleep that time said he rummaging in his pocket for a lucifer it's all right we were doing our prep you know now we've got to be called over if you stick here we'll be back in a jiffy and then we'll take you to see the shop said wally thank ye kindly said the guest don't put yourselves about for me take your time young gents we shan't be long i say wait for us won't you don't you go out with any other chaps they ain't in it you know i ain't a-going with nobody don't you make no mistake was the visitor's satisfactory assurance 
they had some thoughts about locking him in to make sure of him but decided to trust his parole and trooped down impatiently to call over binding one another to assemble at the shop immediately afterwards whither wally and percy were to conduct their guest to the satisfaction of these young gentlemen the bird was safely in his cage when they returned dimly visible through the smoke looking at the pictures in the illustrated paper he meekly obeyed their summons relieving their embarrassment somewhat by putting his pipe away in his pocket as he rose where's the rest of the pals asked he down at the shop it's not the regular hour you know but we can get in with the key come along mr rollitt the old watch-tower which as the reader knows is the oldest remaining portion of fellsgarth was rather an imposing-looking edifice for so mundane an establishment as the school shop the shop indeed occupied only a small apartment on the ground floor which had previously been used as a porter's lodge the remainder of the structure including the disused belfry and watch turret being abandoned to the owls and ghosts and ivy which accorded best with the ancient traditions of the place mr rollitt whose profession sharpened his observation for specimens of bygone achievements in his own line of business noted the venerable exterior before him with admiration that there bit of bricks and mortar said he warn't built yesterday oh it's millions of years old said wally but our shop you know has only just been started they don't make copins like them to-day repeated mr rollitt we go in for good grub cheap said percy no shoe leather like bob used to sell i reckon them top courses is a hundred year after this here bottom part not much jerry there neither we boss it among us you know said wally and take turns to serve we don't get a bad profit either here they were joined by the rest of the party but to their disappointment mr rollitt's interest in the shop was small compared with that he showed in the lay of the bricks the run of the beams and the hardness of the mortar they knowed their way about straight those days said he picking away between two of the bricks with his nail try one of our rollitt's particulars pleaded d'arcy in the hope that this invitation at least would interest him but no he went nosing round taking no notice of the stores and putting off all invitations with a thank you kindly not to-day it was a sore blow to his hosts after what they had done for him after the way they had nursed him all day after the tea that they had given him and the pipes he had smoked in their study they could have thrown him overboard in their mortification but the dread lest some one else some of the middle boys for instance should get hold of him and run him decided them to pocket their feelings and back him up still no offence young gents said he pleasantly but if you've a ladder andy i'd like to take a look up there oh there's nothing up there only bats and owls said wally and there's no ladder but mr rollitt pointed out in a corner behind the back of the shop some protruding bits of stone let into the brick evidently with a view to form a rude ladder or stair to the chambers above this promised well an exploration of the watch-tower offered some little compensation for the slight put on their shop i never saw that before said wally i vote we go up mr rollitt led the way with all the agility of a practical hodman the steps ended with a trap-door in the ceiling which he pushed up before him mind how you go young gents said he to his followers one at a time on them stones the trap-door opened into a sort of passage at the end of which was a narrow brick corkscrew staircase it was too dark to do anything but feel their way up mr rollitt leading and testing every step as he went along why said wally suddenly and with a touch of alarm in his voice as they were halting a moment to allow mr rollitt to inspect with the end of a lucifer one of the loophole windows why look up there there's a light they looked and there struggling apparently from under a door which closed the head of the stairs 
came a streak of light i say it's ghosts said fisher minor let's go back more likely it's my alf said mr rollitt i knowed he was somewheres not fur off he went up followed at a more respectful distance than before by the boys and pushed open the door they heard the sound of an exclamation within and a noise as of some one starting to his feet next moment as the light streamed down the staircase they heard a familiar voice say father that's me alf my boy i knowed you was somewheres andy i say said wally in an excited whisper to his followers we'd best cut back you chaps they don't want us up there the delicate suggestion was appreciated by the party who forthwith made a precipitate retreat we as good as found him that's one thing and nobody else was in it said percy triumphantly rather not keep it mum let's go and light the fire in his room and have some grub ready for him good old rollitt i'm jolly glad he's turned up that's how he got the abernethy said d'arcy jolly honest to pay for them you don't suppose anybody would collar things out of the shop and not pay for them you lout do you whereat leaving the door on the latch they marched arm in arm across the school green kicking every junior they met and mystifying everybody by whistling at the top of their voices see the conquering hero comes End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six the final kick rollitt's return to fellsgarth was almost as mysterious as his disappearance he answered to his name at call over next morning as if he had never missed a day this term and as dr ringwood and the other masters were present and made no remark it was generally concluded that the truant had turned up overnight and had had it out with the authorities before bedtime mr rollitt senior had departed he had looked into wally's study after the owner and his crew were in bed to get his bag and had been driven down in the doctor's fly to penchurch it was also understood that most of the classic seniors had dropped into rollitt's study early that morning to some he had said get out with others he had shaken hands the captain had evidently been among the latter as on the notice-board that morning among the names of the fifteen who were to play the first match of the new clubs on saturday against penchurch was that of rollitt the excitement caused by this discovery almost put into the shade for the time the equally remarkable fact that clapperton and brinkman were included in the same team where rollitt had been and what he had been doing remained a mystery it was of course out of the question to ask him conjecture was rife and was greatly assisted by the juniors who hazarded all sorts of plausible explanations for the general benefit think he's been to land's end said wally i hear you can do it in a week sharp walking you can get to america in that time said lickford yes he does seem to have rather a twang on him perhaps that's where he's been to remarked d'arcy penny bank coal mines only fifty miles away said percy it runs under the sea ever so far i should say it was a ripping place to hide in from which and other similar remarks it was concluded that the juniors had a much better notion as to where rollitt had been than they chose to admit they 
eagerly embraced the first opportunity of going to the shop and investigating the scene of the mystery for themselves they carefully locked the outer door against possible intruders and then in indian file ascended the stone ladder and after it the corkscrew staircase the room in which they found themselves was pretty much as rollitt had left it it had evidently been made use of by a former lodge-keeper as a dwelling-room for there was a ragged paper on the wall and an attempt here and there to board over dangerous holes in the floor besides which there was a rude shutter to the tiny window by means of which no doubt rollitt had succeeded in concealing his presence at night the remains of a wood fire were on the hearth and a candle end showed what they already knew that the hermit did not spend all his evenings in darkness more than this in one corner still lay some of the wraps which he had evidently used to extemporize a bed and an empty box on end in the window convinced them he had sat down during part of his residence there was also a leaf of exercise paper and a horse lying on the floor which evidently had not been brought there by the owls altogether as they looked round they concluded that but for the cold he might have had worse quarters during his temporary exile but the discovery that delighted them most was a fragment of a newspaper in which were wrapped the not yet exhausted end of a ham and half a biscuit over these relics they dwelt with quite an affectionate interest till somebody said what did he have to drink he didn't take any of our ginger beer and there's no water here why you duffer of course he could get out any time he liked it's only a latch on the door any one can open it from inside he could easily get down to the river in the night and have a tub and fetch up some water they decided that in future the shop committee except when mr and mrs stratton were present should meet nowhere but in rollitt's chamber as they forthwith named the room and proceeded to dedicate it to that use there and then do you know said wally that after we pay back mr stratton what he lent us to start with there'll be a clear five pounds to give to the clubs out of the profits not bad said percy they ought to put us in the first fifteen for that never mind said d'arcy they've got a jolly hot fifteen for saturday rollitt and all of em we ought to put the penchurch chaps to bed for once i fancy this was the general impression throughout the school and as if to make up for the abstinence of the past few weeks the fervour of the athletic set waxed high as the eventful day drew near york had out his men once or twice practising kicks and selecting where in the field each player could work to best advantage rollitt of course did not attend these practices but clapperton and brinkman did and soon lost the embarrassment with which they first faced their old rivals and enemies corder was down too dreadfully afraid lest by some mishap he should discredit himself and so he knocked out of his coveted place in the team mr stratton was on the spot also advising and admonishing as no one knew better how to do even the doctor showed his interest in the new departure of the clubs by coming down too and by giving directions to reserve seats in the pavilion for a party of his friends the only unenthusiastic person except rollitt was dangle he tried at first to brazen it out and came down to the field with a sneer on his face to look so he said at the good boys exercising themselves but the junior soon routed him out of that attitude boo hoo rollitt's coming wants to hear you call him a thief run he'll catch you put it on 
well run dangle you've missed him this time coast's clear now you can come back we'll protect you and so on these attentions made dangle's visits to the field less frequent in school he kept the swagger up still longer so said he one day to clapperton i thought you didn't approve of cutting fellows dead no more i do why do you do it then have you apologized to rollitt no has rollitt thrashed you no when one or the other has happened i shall be delighted to shake hands said clapperton the alternative was a dismal one but dangle saw no third way which course was least to be desired he could not for the life of him decide a fight with rollitt he knew would end disastrously but to apologize and in public the reader has already had two football matches in the course of this story he shall not be wearied with a third suffice it to say that penchurch men men not boys presented themselves on the appointed day and all fellsgarth turned out to see the battle fisher minor scored one more triumph by bringing rollitt up to the scratch and so completing as sound and taut a team as york had ever led on to victory mrs stratton was there wearing the school colours round her hat and the doctor was there with his field-glasses pointing out the heroes of the school to his distinguished visitors this time by much squeezing and mutual accommodation the oak tree was made to hold nine persons who those nine were none could guess unless indeed they happened to be standing within a hundred yards of the spot without cotton-wool in their ears from the first it went hard with the penchurch men the school had never played up better the scrimmages were beautifully packed and the quarter and half-backs were never off the spot only when above the crowd rollitt's head was seen to be at work and it was apparent he had waked up for a time was there any risk of confusion but york's play on rollitt generally pulled the scrimmage together again and warned friend and after a time foe what to expect there was no holding rollitt back when he once made up his mind to get the ball through and no stopping him when once he got fairly started on a run twice before half-time and once after he scored a touchdown twice york did the same and once clapperton corder discovered that a fellow does not always score and yet may play a steady useful game he was disappointed that it was only left him to do the latter and he set himself down as a failure but mr stratton put him on his feet wonderfully at the end you've improved corder you never played as well the others worked well and contributed to the great result and perhaps better still grudged no one his greater glory it was fellsgarth that was playing not fullerton ranger brinkman fisher major or anybody else the final goal was clapperton's it was an historic event for the first time in the match the penchurch men had worked the ball up into the boys quarters and fears were being entertained lest after all they would save their duck the half-backs and quarter-backs of the school were squeezed in all of a lump between touch and goal and those who looked on noticed with alarm that as matters now stood an easy drop kick from any of the enemy's forwards might capture the goal rollitt was the first to put an end to this dangerous state of things he bore down the scrimmage after his usual fashion and succeeded as he broke through in getting the ball into his hands but for once he could get no further twenty hands seized him and carried him to the ground but not before he had sent back the ball into fisher's hands 
back up now hard and fast cried yorke never was order more beautifully carried out fisher minor held the leather long enough to pass it to brinkman brinkman staggered on a yard or two and slipped it back to denton denton made a yard or two more and passed it to corder corder fell back with it into the arms of ranger ranger let corder drop but captured the ball and with one of his lightning swoops carried it out of the ruck for twenty yards when as he fell york came up and captured it york alas was cut short in his career before he had gone ten yards but clapperton was there to take it away he went shaking off the nearest of his assailants and distancing others till he too fell gloriously with his body in play and his hands in touch thirty yards from the enemy's lines the serried ranks formed up on either side clapperton as he stood ball in hand ready to throw in past his eye along the line of his friends and stopped short of york york understood he caught the ball and quick as thought returned it to clapperton who swooping round behind the line got clear with it once more and crossing the field curving in all the way carried into the enemy's lines at their far corner whence with a wide sweep he brought it round right behind their posts a beautiful climax to a beautiful piece of cooperative play as mr stratton said nothing all that term had been more hopeful of the new spirit of mutual confidence and support in the school than this triumphant rally but the goal was yet to be kicked to york of course belonged the honour but york to every one's surprise stood out no said he it's clapperton's goal he shall kick it so fellsgarth perhaps for the first and only time in its records stood by and witnessed the phenomenon of its captain carrying out the ball and placing it for the vice-captain to kick it needed all clapperton's nerve to save him from flurry and failure even over an easy task like this but he pulled himself together and kicked the goal and with that kick he sent flying into the air the last remnant of the bad blood and jealousy which had marred the term and all but wrecked the good old school here let us say good-bye perhaps not for good for york and rollitt and clapperton and fisher and all of them are still alive and kicking rollitt to the general regret but to his own satisfaction left fellsgarth at the end of the term for the more congenial course of a school of engineering before he left he invited fisher minor to tea in his room and alarmed that young gentleman by sitting for a whole hour without uttering a word at length when the guest had to leave he said thanks fisher minor thank those fellows of yours tell york the money that bought the boat was what i had been saving for something else i'll write to you get out now that was the last of rollitt dangle never made up his mind either to apologize or take a thrashing he never met rollitt after the return of the latter when breaking up day came he got an excuse to go home earlier than the general crowd and when school reassembled in january it was known he had left fellsgarth for good the two events of the breaking up hall were first the announcement by the doctor that at his request york would stay on another term at fellsgarth secondly the presentation of a purse containing five pounds to the school clubs by the nine juniors as the profits for the term on the business of the school shop which of these two events produced the more terrific cheers the reader must take upon himself to decide an hour later messieurs wally d'arcy ashby fisher minor percy cottle lickford ramshaw and cash limited walked arm in arm across the green 
after a farewell call on mrs stratton on their way to the school omnibus which waited at the watch-tower their progress was temporarily interrupted by the sudden bolt of fisher minor in pursuit of a lank cadaverous figure wearing the modern colours who was strolling innocently off in the direction of mr forder's house the young uns got em again said wally here come back young fisher minor can't you we shan't wait fisher minor pulled up he looked wistfully first at the retreating figure in the distance then at his eight friends with a sigh he decided on the latter and for that term at least finally abandoned the quest of his unlucky half-crown it took some little time to arrange matters on the omnibus as one or two innocent middle boys had had the audacity to occupy the box-seat and the row behind and had to be cajoled or pulled down how could any one dare when those two seats just held nine to imagine that they were not sacred property that's better said wally when at last the party were safely up with two rugs over their eighteen knees and a gross of brandy-balls circulating for the common comfort touch em up driver give em their heads i tell you what you chaps this has been rather a slow half i vote we have some larks next term rather chimed in the chorus the end end of chapter twenty six end of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed